This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 10 through 12. Chapter 10 A Bosom Friend. Returning to the Spouter Inn from the chapel, I found Queequeg there quite alone, he having left the chapel before the benediction some time. He was sitting on a bench before the fire, with his feet on the stove-hearth, and in one hand was holding close to his face that little negro idol of his, peering hard into its face, and with a jack-knife gently whittling away at its nose, meanwhile humming to himself in his heathenish way. But being now interrupted, he put up the image, and pretty soon, going to the table, took up a large book there, and placing it on his lap, began counting the pages with deliberate regularity, at every fiftieth page, as I fancied, stopping a moment, looking vacantly around him, and giving utterance to a long-drawn gurgling whistle of astonishment. He would then begin again at the next fifty, seeming to commence at the number one each time, as though he could not count more than fifty, and it was only by such a large number of fifties being found together that his astonishment at the multitude of pages was excited. With much interest I sat watching him. Savage though he was, and hideously marred about the face, at least to my taste, his countenance yet had something in it which was by no means disagreeable. You cannot hide the soul. Through all his unearthly tattooings I thought I saw the traces of a simple, honest heart, and in his large, deep eyes, fiery black and bold, there seemed tokens of a spirit that would dare a thousand devils. And besides all this there was a certain lofty bearing about the pagan, which even his uncouthness could not altogether maim. He looked like a man who had never cringed and had never had a creditor. Whether it was, too, that his head being shaved, his forehead was drawn out in freer and brighter relief, and looked more expansive than it otherwise would, this I will not venture to decide. But certain it was, his head was phrenologically an excellent one. It may seem ridiculous, but it reminded me of General Washington's head, as seen in the popular busts of him. It had the same long, regularly graded, retreating slope from above the brows, which were likewise very projecting, like two long promontories thickly wooded on top. Queequeg was George Washington cannibalistically developed. Whilst I was thus closely scanning him, half pretending meanwhile to be looking out at the storm from the casement, he never heeded my presence, never troubled himself with so much as a single glance, but appeared wholly occupied with counting the pages of the marvellous book. Considering how sociably we had been sleeping together the night previous, and especially considering the affectionate arm I had found thrown over me waking in the morning, I thought this indifference of his very strange. But savages are strange beings. At times you do not know exactly how to take them. At first they are overawing. Their calm self-collectedness of simplicity seems a Socratic wisdom. I had noticed also that Queequeg never consorted at all, or but very little, with the other seamen in the inn. He made no advances whatever, appeared to have no desire to enlarge the circle of his acquaintances. All this struck me as mighty singular, yet upon second thoughts there was something almost sublime in it. Here was a man some twenty thousand miles from home, by way of Cape Horn, that is, which was the only way he could get there, thrown among people as strange to him as though he were in the planet Jupiter. And yet he seemed entirely at his ease, preserving the utmost serenity, content with his own companionship, always equal to himself. Surely this was a touch of fine philosophy, though no doubt he had never heard there was such a thing as that. But perhaps, to be true philosophers, we mortals should not be conscious of so living or so striving. So soon as I hear that such and such a man gives himself out for a philosopher, I conclude that, like the dyspeptic old woman, he must have broken his digester. As I sat there in that now lonely room, the fire burning low in that mild stage when, after its first intensity has warmed the air, it then only glows to be looked at, 
the evening shades and phantoms gathering round the casements, and peering in upon us silent solitary twain, the storm booming without in solemn swells, I began to be sensible of strange feelings. I felt a melting in me. No more my splintered heart and maddened hand were turned against the wolfish world. This soothing savage had redeemed it. There he sat, his very indifference speaking a nature in which there lurked no civilized hypocrisies and bland deceits. Wild he was, a very sight of sights to see, yet I began to feel myself mysteriously drawn towards him. And those same things that would have repelled most others, they were the very magnets that thus drew me. I'll try a pagan friend, thought I, since Christian kindness has proved but hollow courtesy. I drew my bench near him, and made some friendly signs and hints, doing my best to talk with him meanwhile. At first he little noticed these advances, but presently, upon my referring to his last night's hospitalities, he made out to ask me whether we were again to be bedfellows. I told him yes, whereat I thought he looked pleased, perhaps a little complimented. We then turned over the book together, and I endeavoured to explain to him the purpose of the printing, and the meaning of the few pictures that were in it. Thus I soon engaged his interest, and from that we went to jabbering the best we could about the various outer sights to be seen in this famous town. Soon I proposed a social smoke, and producing his pouch and tomahawk, he quietly offered me a puff. And then we sat exchanging puffs from that wild pipe of his, and keeping it regularly passing between us. If there yet lurked any ice of indifference toward me in the pagan's breast, this pleasant, genial smoke we had soon thawed it out, and left us cronies. He seemed to take to me quite as naturally and unbiddenly as I to him, and when our smoke was over he pressed his forehead against mine, clasped me round the waist, and said that henceforth we were married, meaning, in his country's phrase, that we were bosom friends. He would gladly die for me, if the need should be. In a countryman this sudden flame of friendship would have seemed far too premature, a thing to be much distrusted, but in this simple savage those old rules would not apply. After supper and another social chat and smoke we went to our room together. He made me a present of his embalmed head, took out his enormous tobacco wallet, and groping under the tobacco drew out some thirty dollars in silver. Then, spreading them on the table, and mechanically dividing them into two equal portions, pushed one of them toward me, and said it was mine. I was going to remonstrate, but he silenced me by pouring them into my trousers' pockets. I let them stay. He then went about his evening prayers, took out his idol, and removed the paper fireboard. By certain signs and symptoms I thought he seemed anxious for me to join him, but well knowing what was to follow, I deliberated a moment whether, in case he invited me, I would comply or otherwise. I was a good Christian, born and bred in the bosom of the infallible Presbyterian Church. How, then, could I unite with this wild idolater in worshipping his piece of wood? But what is worship, thought I? Do you suppose now, Ishmael, that the magnanimous God of heaven and earth, pagans and all included, can possibly be jealous of an insignificant bit of black wood? Impossible. But what is worship? To do the will of God, that is worship. And what is the will of God? To do to my fellow man what I would have my fellow man do to me, that is the will of God. Now Queequeg is my fellow man. And what do I wish that this Queequeg would do to me? Why, well, unite with me in my particular Presbyterian form of worship. Consequently, I must then unite with him in his. Ergo, I must turn idolater. So I kindled the shavings, helped prop up the innocent little idol, offered him burnt biscuit with Queequeg, salaamed before him twice or thrice, kissed his nose, and that done, we undressed and went to bed, at peace with our own consciences and all the world. But we did not go to sleep without some little chat. How it is I know not, but there is no place like a bed for confidential disclosures between friends. Man and wife, they say, there open the very bottom of their souls to each other, and some old couples often lie and chat over old times till nearly morning. Thus, then, in our heart's honeymoon, lay I and Queequeg, a cosy, loving pair. CHAPTER Eleven. 
Nightgown We had lain thus in bed, chatting and napping at short intervals, and Queequeg now and then affectionately throwing his brown tattooed legs over mine, and then drawing them back, so entirely sociable and free and easy were we, when at last, by reason of our confabulations, what little nappishness remained in us altogether departed, and we felt like getting up again, though daybreak was yet some way down the future. Yes, we became very wakeful, so much so that our recumbent position began to grow wearisome, and by little and little we found ourselves sitting up, the clothes well tucked around us, leaning against the headboard with our four knees drawn up close together and our two noses bending over them, as if our knee-pans were warming-pans. We felt very nice and snug, the more so since it was so chilly out of doors, indeed out of bedclothes too, seeing that there was no fire in the room. The more so, I say, because truly to enjoy bodily warmth some small part of you must be cold, for there is no quality in this world that is not what it is merely by contrast. Nothing exists in itself. If you flatter yourself that you are all over comfortable, and have been so for a long time, then you cannot be said to be comfortable any more. But if, like Queequeg and me in the bed, the tip of your nose or the crown of your head be slightly chilled, why then indeed in the general consciousness you feel most delightfully and unmistakably warm. For this reason a sleeping apartment should never be furnished with a fire, which is one of the luxurious discomforts of the rich. For the height of this sort of deliciousness is to have nothing but the blanket between you and your snugness and the cold of the outer air. Then there you lie like the one warm spark in the heart of an arctic crystal. We had been sitting in this crouching manner for some time when all at once I thought I would open my eyes, for when between sheets, whether by day or by night, and whether asleep or awake, I have a way of always keeping my eyes shut, in order the more to concentrate on the snugness of being in bed. Because no man can ever feel his own identity aright except his eyes be closed, as if darkness were indeed the proper element of our essences, though light be more congenial to our clayey part. Upon opening my eyes, then, and coming out of my own pleasant and self-created darkness into the imposed and coarse outer gloom of the unilluminated twelve o'clock at night, I experienced a disagreeable revulsion. Nor did I at all object to the hint from Queequeg that perhaps it were best to strike a light, seeing that we were so wide awake, and besides he felt a strong desire to have a few quiet puffs from his tomahawk. Be it said that though I had felt such a strong repugnance to his smoking in the bed the night before, yet see how elastic our stiff prejudices grow when love comes once to bend them. For now I like nothing better than to have Queequeg smoking by me, even in bed, because he seemed to be full of such serene household joy then. I no more felt unduly concerned for the landlord's policy of insurance. I was only alive to the condensed, confidential comfortableness of sharing a pipe and a blanket with a real friend. With our shaggy jackets drawn about our shoulders, we now passed the tomahawk from one to the other, till slowly there grew over us a blue-hanging tester of smoke, illuminated by the flame of the new-lit lamp. Whether it was that this undulating tester rolled the savage away to far distant scenes, I know not. But he now spoke of his native island, and eager to hear his history, I begged him to go on and tell it. He gladly complied. Though at the time I but ill comprehended not a few of his words, yet subsequent disclosures, when I had become more familiar with his broken phraseology, now enable me to present the whole story, such as it may prove, in the mere skeleton I give. CHAPTER Twelve, BIOGRAPHICAL Queequeg was a native of Cocovoco, an island far away to the west and south. It is not down in any map. True places never are. When a new-hatched savage, running wild about his native woodlands in a grass-clout, followed by the nibbling goats, as if he were a green sapling, even then, in Queequeg's ambitious soul, lurked a strong desire to see something more of Christendom than a specimen whaler or two. His father was a high chief, a king, his uncle a high priest, and on the maternal side he boasted aunts who were the wives of unconquerable warriors. There was excellent blood in his veins, royal stuff, 
though sadly vitiated, I fear, by the cannibal propensity he nourished in his untutored youth. A Sag Harbor ship visited his father's bay, and Queequeg sought a passage to the Christian lands. But the ship, having her full complement of seamen, spurned his suit, and not all the king his father's influence could prevail. But Queequeg vowed a vow. Alone in his canoe he paddled off to a distant strait, which he knew the ship must pass through when she quitted the island. On one side was a coral reef, on the other a low tongue of land, covered with mangrove thickets that grew out into the water. Hiding his canoe, still afloat among these thickets, with its prow seaward, he sat down in the stern, paddle low in hand, and when the ship was gliding by, like a flash he darted out, gained her side, and with one backward dash of his foot, capsized and sank the canoe, climbed up the chains, and throwing himself at full length upon the deck, grappled a ring-bolt there, and swore not to let go, though hacked in pieces. In vain the captain threatened to throw him overboard, suspended a cutlass over his naked wrists. Queequeg was the son of a king, and Queequeg budged not. Struck by his desperate dauntlessness, and his wild desire to visit Christendom, the captain at last relented, and told him he might make himself at home. But this fine young savage, this sea prince of Wales, never saw the captain's cabin. They put him down among the sailors, and made a whaleman of him. But like Tsar Peter, content to toil in the shipyards of foreign cities, Queequeg disdained no seeming ignominy, if thereby he might happily gain the power of enlightening his untutored countrymen. For at bottom, so he told me, he was actuated by a profound desire to learn among the Christians the arts whereby to make his people still happier than they were, and more than that, still better than they were. But, alas, the practices of whalemen soon convinced him that even Christians could be both miserable and wicked, infinitely more so than all his father's heathens, arrived at last in old Sag Harbor, and seeing what the sailors did there, and going on to Nantucket, and seeing how they spent their wages in that place also, poor Queequeg gave it up for lost. Thought he, it's a wicked world in all meridians. I'll die a pagan. And thus, an old idolater at heart, he yet lived among these Christians, wore their clothes, and tried to talk their gibberish, hence the queer ways about him, though now some time from home. By hints I asked him whether he did not propose going back, and having a coronation, since he might now consider his father dead and gone, he being very old and feeble at the last accounts. He answered no, not yet, and added that he was fearful Christianity, or rather Christians, had unfitted him for ascending the pure and undefiled throne of thirty pagan kings before him. But by and by, he said, he would return, as soon as he felt himself baptized again. For the nonce, however, he proposed to sail about and sow his wild oats in all four oceans. They had made a harpooner of him, and that barbed iron was in lieu of a scepter now. I asked him what might be his immediate purpose touching his future movements. He answered to go to sea again, in his old vocation. Upon this I told him that whaling was my own design, and informed him of my intention to sail out of Nantucket, as being the most promising port for an adventurous whaleman to embark from. He at once resolved to accompany me to that island, ship aboard the same vessel, get into the same watch, the same boat, the same mess with me, in short, to share my every hap, with both my hands in his, boldly dip into the potluck of both worlds. To all this I joyously assented, for besides the affection I now felt for Queequeg, he was an experienced harpooner, and as such could not fail to be of great usefulness to one who, like me, was wholly ignorant of the mysteries of whaling, though well acquainted with the sea, as known to merchant seamen. His story being ended, with his pipe's last dying puff, Queequeg embraced me, pressed his forehead against mine, and blowing out the light, we rolled over from each other this way and that, and very soon were sleeping. End of chapters 10 through 12